Can you imagine thousands of mice falling from the sky with tiny parachutes? Well, that's what happened in Guam. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a small island in the Pacific that looks very much like a tropical paradise with lots of lush greenery and beautiful vegetation. But behind the scenes, something's been causing problems on the island for quite some time. The Boiga irregularis, or more commonly known as the brown tree snake. This reptile got onto the island somehow and changed the environment in ways no one expected. And later, something unbelievable happened. So to curb the effects of the snakes, they decided to do something crazy. And we're going to find out why exactly thousands of mice were dropped over Guam. Let's start at the very beginning. The island of Guam wasn't always full of snakes. In fact, for most of its history, it didn't have the brown tree snake at all. The problem only started after World War II, and here's where things get a bit tricky. Unlike other invasive pests that are introduced by humans, no one actually intended to bring these reptiles to the island. Instead, a lot of people believe that they slipped onto the island by accident, and they likely got in by hiding inside military cargo. For context, Back then, Guam was a major U.S. base in the Pacific. Ships and planes moved constantly between places like northern and eastern Australia, Papua New Guinea, and islands across Melanesia. Because of this, scientists think that's how the first snakes slipped into Guam. Now, why mention these places? Well, it's because they're where the brown tree snake is native. Over there, it blends into the ecosystem where birds, lizards, and other predators keep their population in check, too. But once it arrived in Guam, things changed. The snakes didn't have any effective natural predators waiting for them. Sure, there were a few potential predators, like monitor lizards and feral pigs, but that wasn't enough to keep the snake population from rising. Fun fact, the brown tree snake is an incredible climber. It moves through trees really easily, slipping across the ground, and sometimes even finding its way into people's homes. It's also a night hunter, which makes it quite hard to catch. And to make things worse, female snakes can lay as many as a dozen eggs at a time. So with enough food around, the population exploded. And that's when people started to realize the scale of the problem. At first, the brown snake's appearance didn't seem like a disaster. People talked about them as a nuisance, not as an island-wide crisis. Farmers lost chickens, and families occasionally found one curled up in a shed or kitchen. The brown tree snake was annoying, yes, but not terrifying. But it quickly went from a minor jump scare to a real problem when the changes began to add up. By the 1960s, the forest started feeling a bit different. Older residents remembered the island being alive with sound, but those sounds were fading. Morning walks were quieter, and insects built up in ways people had not seen before. It became pretty obvious to the locals that something was off. To get answers, scientists from the University of Guam and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began their surveys. What they found was shocking. The island's bird population was crashing fast, and there was no one to blame but the stowaway snakes. By the early 1980s, field studies showed that most of the native forest birds had vanished or were on the brink of disappearing. That kind of collapse had rarely been documented anywhere else in the world within such a short period of time. The data pointed to one clear cause. The brown tree snake had multiplied far beyond what anyone expected. On an island with no predators, plenty of food, and warm forests to hide in, it's no surprise these serpents thrived at the detriment of the local fauna. Biologists estimated there were tens of thousands on the island. In some forested hotspots, surveys suggested densities as high as 10,000 snakes per square mile. And I'll let you know, that's one of the highest snake densities ever recorded anywhere. For a small island like Guam, these numbers explained why wildlife was disappearing so quickly. In just a few decades, they disrupted the ecosystem. However, the problem wasn't just ecological, it was also economic. Beginning in the 1970s, Guam's power system started having repeated blackouts. At first, people blamed faulty equipment, the most obvious scapegoat. But then engineers started investigating. They found out that the snakes had wrapped themselves around power poles and wires, and the effects were huge. Some reports say that the island had lost millions because of the power outages caused by snakes. Businesses had to deal with downtime, and military bases faced interruptions that simply couldn't be ignored. The invasion also brought new public safety concerns, and so the conversation shifted. It was no longer about whether the snakes were an issue. That debate was over. Instead, the big question was how to respond. 
could the population be controlled? Because the invasion was spreading so quickly, action couldn't be delayed. People had to try whatever methods they could to hold the snakes back. One of the earliest strategies was trapping. It sounds easy, right? Build a trap, catch a snake, repeat. Scientists and local authorities designed special traps that used live mice as bait. Don't get me wrong, this method worked, but only to a point. The traps caught snakes in small areas, like around villages or military bases, but the island was just too large to cover effectively. It was like a needle in a haystack. Next came barriers. Their goal with this was to keep snakes out of sensitive places. Engineers built snake-proof fences around power stations and warehouses. Some of these fences even came with electric features designed to shock snakes that tried to climb. These barriers were quite useful in protecting specific facilities. The only downside is that they were expensive and difficult to maintain. As a result, theoretical thoughts of covering the entire island with fencing weren't very realistic. Additionally, locating the snakes was another big focus. Snakes weren't simply a problem in Guam itself. There was also the risk of them hitchhiking again and invading new places. To prevent this, authorities brought in detector dogs at ports and airports. These dogs are trained to sniff out snakes hidden in cargo or luggage. So this became a successful measure. Yes, it didn't actually solve Guam's infestation, but it did reduce the chances of the snakes spreading to nearby islands like Hawaii, which were on high alert for years. Moreover, there were also attempts to hunt snakes directly. Some people organized removal teams that went out at night with flashlights, since the snakes are nocturnal. Hunting caught some snakes, but the population was so large that the impact was still really small. Removing a few hundred here and there didn't make a proper dent when tens of thousands were still roaming around in the forests. They also turned to chemical methods. Scientists tested different toxicants, searching for something that would take out the snakes without harming the wildlife. But the search definitely wasn't a simple task. Each option had to meet very tough standards, and because of those limits, the progress was slow. Even so, these early trials played an important Important role. They laid the foundation for the more dramatic mouse drop that arrived soon enough. In the midst of all this, there was a recurring theme. The brown tree snake was simply hard to fight. It was very adaptable. It could live in trees, on the ground, and even in houses. Nearly every method that worked on a small scale seemed to fall short when applied across the whole island. Even so, those early efforts were not a waste. The traps, fences, dogs, and hunting programs did not stop the invasion, but they showed scientists what worked and what probably wouldn't. More importantly, they bought the island something valuable. And that was time. Time to block snakes from reaching new areas. Time to shield key facilities. And time to keep testing fresh ideas. By the 1990s, scientists were running out of options. Traps helped, but not enough. Fences slowed snakes, but only in small areas. Hunting teams caught many, yet the numbers quickly returned. Even detector dogs had limits. They worked well in airports, but they were no help inside the forests. And because of this, researchers knew they needed something different. They began looking for a way to hit the snakes directly. And just as important, they wanted to do it on a scale large enough to finally make a difference. That search soon led to a surprising idea. Why didn't they use poison-laced mice? At first, it sounded very odd. It still sounds odd. Yet there was a reason behind it. Researchers discovered that brown tree snakes had a deadly weakness to something you'd never expect. It was acetaminophen. In other words, the same everyday painkiller found in Tylenol. For humans, it's perfectly safe in small doses, but for the snakes, it proved fatal. Tests showed the difference early. Just 80 milligrams of acetaminophen could take out a brown tree snake completely. So the next challenge was delivery. How could thousands of snakes be given the pills without harming everything else on the island? The solution was simple but clever. Scientists tucked the acetaminophen inside dead mice. Snakes love small mammals, so they would swallow the bait quickly. Other animals on Guam, however, rarely touched the mice. After they decided on this, the plan took an even more creative turn. Dropping mice on the ground would not do much good. After all, the snakes spent most of their time up in the canopy, so the bait had to reach the treetops. The answer came in the form of tiny cardboard parachutes. Yes, you heard right. Parachutes had to be built for the dead mice. They even built tiny parachutes out of cardboard and paper streamers, so each mouse floated gently to the ground instead of just plummeting straight down. Then it caught on the branches, leaving the mouse stuck high above. In other words, the bait stayed right where the snakes liked to hunt. 
The first big drops started in 2013. The U.S. Department of Agriculture teamed up with the Department of Defense to make it happen. Their main target was Anderson Air Force Base in northern Guam. That spot was critical because keeping snakes out of military facilities was a top priority. Helicopters flew low over the forest. Then, thousands of baited mice were pushed out at once. From the ground, it probably looked like something out of a movie. After all, mice with tiny parachutes falling onto the canopy of trees doesn't sound very normal, does it? I imagine it was like the serpent's version of Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. So did this crazy plan actually work? Well, it did, at least in the test areas. Studies showed the baits cut snake numbers in the zones where they were dropped. Since brown tree snakes usually hunt alone, it only took a few poisoned mice to make a difference. Over time, that meant fewer snakes in those patches of forest. And here's another key point. Most other animals on Guam ignored the mice. That kept the risk to the island's remaining wildlife relatively low. Of course, it wasn't perfect. The mouse drops only worked in certain spots, and they needed to be repeated over and over so the pressure wouldn't drop. As a result, Guam still has a lot of snakes today. We all know that wiping all of them out completely wasn't a realistic idea, but the aerial baiting program proved something. It showed that with enough creativity, scientists could fight back. And it proved that large-scale tactics really could slow down one of the toughest invasive species on Earth. The mice dropping strategy had another shortfall, though. Not everyone was on board with the idea. Environmental groups raised concerns right away. They were worried and questioned how ethical it was to drop poisoned mice from the sky. They were also concerned about whether the plan would harm other animals as well, even if studies suggested that the risk of that happening was low. And of course, some other critics argued that it seemed more like a quick fix than a proper, long-lasting solution. And those concerns are still present today. The truth is, Guam's mouse drops might sound sort of absurd to some people. But they're not the only ones trying unusual methods to handle invaders. All over the world, island communities face the same challenge of battling invasive species. A really good example is New Zealand. If there's one country that's made invasive species control part of its national identity, it's them. Rats, stoats, and possums were introduced there in the 1800s and caused absolute chaos for native birds like the kiwi and the kakapo. To fight back, New Zealand started using aerial poison drops. Helicopters were used to drop bait coated with a chemical known as brodifacone. The method was tested in hard-to-reach areas where other approaches failed. In some cases, it worked really well. A good example is what happened on Campbell Island, which is south of New Zealand. There was a massive eradication program in 2001. It wiped out an estimated 200,000 rats in a single campaign. Crazy, right? That was the largest successful rat eradication on a single island in history back then. Now compare that to Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands face serious problems from invasive species. Rats and mongooses cause some of the worst damage. They enter the nests of seabirds and wreak havoc. And if that's not enough, they spread diseases that put native animals at risk. Hawaii tried aerial bait drops to fight back, but the success wasn't the same everywhere. The rugged terrain and large human population make it more difficult to use poison safely. Instead, Hawaii often relies more on predator-proof fences and targeted trapping programs. These efforts are able to protect small, specific areas. However, scaling them up across the entire island chain is tricky. And then we have the Galapagos Islands. They're another well-known case. For many years, the rats there ran wild on the ecology. So in the early 2000s, conservation teams decided to take bold action. On Pinzon Island, they carried out aerial drops of poison pellets. By 2012, the rats that invaded the island were gone. After seeing those results, conservation teams turned their attention to larger islands. Places like Santiago and Floriana became the next targets for removing invasive species. So what can we take away from all this? First, invasive species aren't just a problem for Guam. Every island has lived through the same pattern. People introduce new animals, sometimes unintentionally, like in this case, those animals spread, and the environment ends up paying the price. Second, there isn't a single solution that works 
everywhere. New Zealand's poison drops are pretty effective in remote places with no people, but Hawaii shows just how complicated things get when communities and other species are involved. And here's one more twist you might not expect. The brown tree snake problem hasn't just been about wildlife and power lines, it's also about money and people's daily lives. According to US government estimates, the economic losses tied to these snakes have reached tens of millions of dollars over the decades. Think about it. Every time the power goes out because a snake decided to climb a transformer, businesses lose money, military operations are interrupted, and even hospitals have to switch to backup systems. That adds up quickly. What's even more concerning is that the snakes aren't staying put. Guam has been the launch point for cargo ships and planes heading across the Pacific for years, and every box or crate is a potential hitchhiking opportunity. That's why ports in places like Hawaii and even mainland US military bases have strict inspection systems in place. Trained dogs, special traps, and constant monitoring are now part of the routine, all to make sure one sneaky reptile doesn't spark a brand new invasion somewhere else. Scientists are also exploring more futuristic solutions. Some studies are looking into genetic control, the idea of using biotechnology to reduce snake fertility so their populations shrink naturally. Others are experimenting with drones to drop baits into areas too remote for helicopters. None of these are silver bullets, but they show how seriously experts take the threat. While scientists and the military focused on high-tech solutions, Guam's own communities began adapting in quieter but meaningful ways. Schools introduced programs where kids learned how to identify brown tree snakes and report sightings, almost like junior conservation rangers. Some families even helped conservation teams by monitoring backyard traps. It became part of everyday life. Spotting snakes wasn't just a nuisance, it was a civic duty. Conservationists also began experimenting with something more hopeful bringing birds back. In recent years, fenced sanctuaries known as exclosures were built to keep snakes out of small patches of forest. Within these safe zones, captive-bred native birds, such as the Micronesian kingfisher and Guam rail, could be reintroduced. For the first time in decades, parts of the island heard birdsong again, a small sign that recovery was possible. At the same time, researchers have been pushing creative frontiers. Drones are being tested to deliver bait into dense forests where helicopters can't fly. Genetic control, like altering fertility rates, is being studied as a long-term solution. None of these approaches are ready to replace traditional methods, but together they show just how determined scientists are to keep Guam's invasion from spiraling further. Today, the brown tree snake is not gone. But the fight against it has turned Guam into a global case study. Other islands and nations now look to its programs for lessons on invasive species management. And perhaps the biggest lesson isn't about parachuting mice at all, it's about resilience. An island once overwhelmed by silence is slowly carefully finding ways to bring its forests back to life. So while the image of parachuting mice might sound funny, the story behind it is a reminder of just how inventive people have to get when nature throws a curveball. To sum up, there's still a lot being done to fix the issue of the brown tree snakes on Guam. The falling mice slowed them down a bit, but they're still on the island. Other islands also struggle with their own invaders, and none of the fixes are perfect. What are your thoughts on the brown snakes in Guam? Leave them in the comments. Remember to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video too.